get started. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So as we said, um, topic today is Square Advice and uh, in the spectrum of product organizations. We're joining here with Inej, but she's from Founders Factory and we are product people. To start off the, the speaking session, we're, I'm going to start talking a little bit about me, but I'm going to be the host for today. So my name is Andrea Lopez and I'm the General Growth Marketing Manager at Product People. Uh, my background while well, I first studied uh, a background by Soaring Science and then I specialized in a master's degree in marketing. So I have experience in digital marketing, social media and communication, even though my first work experience was in business development. So, and about us, product people, for these product people, what do I do? So to let you know, uh, proud people, our mission is to help companies discover and deliver great products faster. And we empower our product management community to share knowledge generously while managing the unglamorous hands of work of product manager owner. We do this on an interim basis, which means on missions that last more than three months. And we're specialized in more than fast aligning teams and delivering outcomes. We have more than 14 house product managers as their an interim, which means that we're not freelancers, we're fully, you know joining proud people. And our current community is more than 23K product managers, community members. So uh, to start right off the bat, um, we would like to break the ice a little bit with some questions. And we want to get to know you and get to know how we can help you. So uh, the poll will, will show here if you're joining on Zoom. and um, the first question is, do you feel that you can fully implement product management advice in your current role? This is a question of yes, no. Then the second question is, in your current role, do you get the chance to experiment with different frameworks? And here we have answers, like always, sometimes, rarely. And the third one is, is, did you adapt your product management style for the different organizations that you have worked with? And we also have uh, the yes and no <clears throat> answers. I think for me, like the most interesting one, definitely, and I'm really curious to know, is the, is the third one, because I'm aware that sometimes it's really difficult to adapt uh, your product management style. And, you know, every single company has different approaches and views. So let's see what the audience thinks. We already have some answers. And let's wait a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Quite interesting. I think more than half of the audience have, has already voted. So, mm -hmm. okay, so uh, for the first question, the results is yes, like 67% of the people answer that they can fully implement a product mindset in their current role and 33% said no. And for the second question, uh, the winning like 100% it's sometimes, which is really interesting. And the last one, uh, the winning also 100% is yes, which means that 100% of the people adapt their product management style for the organization they're working with. So uh, following up, uh, we're going to be today with Ines Liberato, and she's a product coach at Founders Factory. Uh, she will introduce herself better when she shares her presentation, I'm sure, but this is a really quick brief about her. And um, now it's up to you. Uh, Ines, I will stop sharing my screen, so the stage is yours.
Thank you, Andrea. That was really interesting to see the answers of the of the questions. Um, in a way, almost uh, uh, happy that uh, there is uh, so many people looking to adapt their style to to the organization, which is a little bit of what we're going to talk about today. Um, it's Today, I wanted to bring a bit of a, a topic that uh, I've seen in a few organizations and a few uh, product people, uh, which is uh, the situation of having so much generalistic uh, type of uh, product advice. And we read so many books and et cetera, and sometimes a little bit challenging to understand what is actually going to move the dial in our organization. Um, and so I decided to put the, the spotlight instead of the product side of things to uh, shift a little bit to the organization side of things. So because sometimes uh, we say that we're empathetic, but uh, we are so down in the, 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 the weeds that it's a little bit challenging uh, to see the other side. So that's what I'm, I'm going to bring today. Um, like, like you said, <laughs> a little bit about me. Uh, I really liked seeing your, your banner. I think it really helps giving some context. So it's a little what, what I try to do here. Um, my background is uh, I have a BA in design. Then I did a, a master's in advertising and marketing. And finally, more recently, I finished an MBA at Imperial College. Um, that BP and AP is before product and after product, because I feel like we all in our product careers, we have a before product life and an after product life. Um, so the industries that I worked uh, in before product uh, were, were education, hospitality. I had uh, a cake design business and retail was uh, head of HR and operations for a big retail brand internationally. Um, and then my first role in product was in affiliate marketing. Um, then I followed to gambling, IoT, um, did some uh, regulation technology as well as head of product across two organizations. And finally, um, more recently, I'm at Founders Factory where I help um, product leaders and uh, CEOs of new ventures to turn their ideas into products and then grow them, essentially. So I get to see a huge variety, a huge context of different leadership styles, different uh, industries, um, different um, understandings of value. Um, and so I feel like I have a very rich um, type of, of background to uh, give this, this kind of opinion. Let's start. Um, so I'd like to, uh, you're probably tired of questions today because it's a very interesting, uh, good format to start sort of with questions, but a little bit to speaking to, to the crowd here. Um, how many of these talks do you normally come to? So how much time do you spend investing in your own product career? And then everything else that you do as well. So how many um, podcasts you listen to, how many product influencers you follow, books, newsletters, everything else. I bet that is a lot. If you're here listening today, uh, I know that you are a person who um, is quite interested in advancing their career in product. Um, plenty. <laughs> And in the middle of all the things that you read and listen to and people you follow, have you ever thought that maybe none of this would actually work in my business? Or you feel like you can always try something else, but eventually things end up not really following through or, or uh, working out very well. And ultimately, you might feel as well that, you know, sometimes I might not be great at this product thing because no one really wants to do these things, no one wants to experiment these things, even though you saw on the poll that sometimes, sometimes people get to experiment things, but it doesn't feel like there's a sustainability to a lot of organizations. Um, and I just wanted to say that you're not alone. There isn't a race, there isn't a competition. Um, we are exposed to a lot of content um, because there's a lot of people writing about it. And there is a lot of lack of context in that content as well. And so it's almost makes you feel like you're not doing how you're supposed to be doing things. Um, but let's deep dive a little bit and see what is happening here. So we have essentially two worlds. You have your whole business, your whole company, and you as a product person. And sometimes they evolve in a separate way, even though. And like you said, and you uh, identified, you uh, have to 
become this. You, your product style, your product personality, your product skills have to adapt to your company. And there, we can break this even a little bit deeper because that's our job is always breaking down the problem. Uh, when you look at the company piece, you are looking into um, having and growing an expertise in understanding the deep the, the the business very quite deeply. So you need to know the the industry, the actor. So where is your uh, who are your competitors? Who are the people who are solving the same problem as you are? Um, who are the um, you know, if you're in a B2B or in a B2C or a B2B to C to C, you have uh, a lot of uh, buyers and influencers, and it's a lot of people to to think about. Um, you need to think about your context. You need to think about the past and the future. Um, then the people who actually work in your business will also have a, be- a very big impact. So your leadership will have a massive impact into the type of business that you lead. Um, Then you need to think about the cycle. So a business with a seasonality will behave completely differently and will have completely different needs to uh, a business that is uh, solving a problem that doesn't necessarily uh, have a seasonality. You know, you you always use your phone versus potentially if you live in the UK, your heating will probably only be turned on during uh, the winter months. Um, And then at the same time, you have all the systems, you know, who uh, gets rewarded for what, the culture, the patterns, how you track what. But then as a product person, you are thinking about your skills. So from a product stage, you need to think about the whole range between discovery to decline of a product. Those require different skills and experience. Um, the, the type of uh, this is the first bit that you kind of try to align to the business, which is do you have some sort of history when you think about your product expertise? And finally, your type of product as well, which will massively impact your skills. And then your experience, you know, are we talking about do you come from a design background, UX, technology, business, and on what level, which indicate the type of influence that you have in the organization as well? So there's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot to consider and there's a lot to align here. It is important to have this completely broken down, um, but it is important to see um, that there's a lot for you to take care of. So let's, um, okay, Um, a deep, because we all very familiar with the product piece, it's interesting to look at the business uh, piece. So in most cases, um, unless you are a charity or you work for impact, mostly measures where you measure value in a different way, not necessarily monetarily, but you're still tracking value, how you're adding value. Um, but there is this huge concept that we all are very familiar with, which is making a profit. So understanding how your business makes a profit, it is very important, but making it very simple. So you making a profit is investing some money and expecting more money in return, you know, revenue minus cost. And for organizations, each cost that they have, so cost in a team, cost in uh, an, an experiment, cost in anything that they invest in will be a bet because depending on the, the risk level, the confidence level, you will want to make sure that you will be spending as much or less money than the one that you're going to take back. Simple, you're still with me? Not breaking anyone with finance here? Okay. Um, Ultimately, what companies try to get to is what we call economies of scale. So the more you make something, the less it costs. So it's like practicing uh, an instrument uh, you will have to, you'll know uh, the, to, the keys of the piano um, better the more you practice. So you'll take, you get more efficient at it. So that's essentially where businesses try to get to, repetitive and sustainable, uh, in a way, um, actions. But the reality is building software doesn't work that way. <laughs> Um, It doesn't necessarily, uh, it isn't such a direct connection between this economies of scale. However, we are still working very much with this legacy. We all know the uh, John uh, Cutler's um, 12 signs that you're working in a a feature factory because this is still the the, the mentality that you bring today into into businesses. And so today, I'd like to 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 say and to give some hope 
and to say that we can break this down and we can identify some uh, broad areas, our spectrum, and try to understand how we can best navigate this. Hope you're ready. Um, so if we, if we think about um, the industries uh, and the businesses that you are, uh, we normally can assess the type of strategy that they're going to apply based on how predictable the markets are. So how confident are you that the thing that you're planning for the future is going to you know, give the return that you're expecting versus how malleable it is? So uh, can what is the level of influence that you and the people who are operating in that space have to control the environment? And we have here the beautiful tool of product management, the matrix, it solves all the problems. Um, we start with the classical. So you can predict it, but you can't change it. I'll give examples on uh, next, just to break it down for now. We have an adaptive style, which you can predict it and you cannot change it. So very uh, turbulent there. You have the shaping one, as per the, the name says, you can't really predict it, but you can have an impact on it. Um, and finally, um, the vision one, that is not uh, the visionary one, that you can predict it and you can change it. So I'm going to leave this slide here for a bit, but I'm also happy to, if you reach out, I'm also happy to send these slides over because I can then send you as well some exercises for you to do to see where you sit in this, this kind of spectrum here. But you can see, it'd be good to, to get a bit more context if you can pop in your the industries that you're currently working on. So maybe you can find them in a the map easier. Um, and you take hers. For example, in the industries where I've worked in the past, um, we have, um, it's funny to see IT services here because at the, when this chart was uh, created, um, we th were still thinking about everyone working from the office, for example. Uh, so very expected. Uh, textiles and apparel uh, happen here because like, for example, a very good example of adaptive strategy, we have Zara that is works really closely with um, uh, designers and the value chain to uh, create uh, fashion very quickly and put it out in the market very quickly and see what happens. Here on the shaping piece, we can have, see you have healthcare technology, very interesting because it's a very unpredictable industry, but there's, you know, the people who are working in it um, have a massive impact because they're incredibly knowledgeable, not normally come from a health background and it is constantly evolving. It actually is um, motivated that there, there is evolution and there is uh, innovation here. Um, and then here you have very interesting uh, actors here. We have software, you know, all the things that we're using today, media, aerospace, defense, and, and insurance, funnily enough, um, because it's so predictable. Uh, everyone needs insurance, but at the same time, we see things like FinTech and RegTech coming up here as uh, the big changes that tech can, can upbring. So, oh, this, my slides are a bit um, uh, different, but hey. Um, so how do we do we work these this kind of spectrum? So like we said, I've kind of identified a couple of examples in the past there. But if you start with the classical uh, piece, we have the classical one. We we can all all tell it's it's the heavy ones. Uh, it's the biggest, the 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 very predictable type of of, of scenarios and environments. Uh, to win here, you need to have a big, deep analysis, a lot of planning and execution, very risk averse, I would say sometimes because it's because it's predictable, you kind of want to know what, what you're going to get. Um, they value experience quite a bit and there's and the market share. So market share being big is important. Moving up in terms of, of being, oh, thank you slides, um, following my, my speech, uh, being adaptive here and, and be fast, like I gave the example of, of Zara in the past, but you can think about a lot of different technologies that, uh, for example, having um, it iterate frequently and have speed and flexibility. I'm thinking about a Miro here, for example. They were quite quick to, to come up and, and invest on uh, tools for us to while we were in all in lockdown and there were no physical whiteboards. 
they're great. They were fast and there were other competitors, but I feel like now in the market, they're quite big. Um, we have the shaping piece and this, the shaping piece is a really interesting because it's mostly an ecosystem and, and platform uh, play. So essentially who holds the platform wins. This is where we see the B2B to C markets uh, playing really well. So if you are the one who does holds the connections and is uh, uh, connects A to B, um, it, you, you end up winning. Uh, type of strategy. And finally, our visionary, and this one is a really interesting one, being the first one, uh, the kind of build it and they'll come uh, type of approach. So we have, for example, uh, I would say Google here, it's it's uh, a quite visionary. They they were not necessarily the first, but they were, you know, kind of encompassed these whole uh, different uh, approaches to it. Um. I would like to finally around this piece here, I think it'd be interesting to then, you know, we've been talking about, we started by talking a little bit about the um, the frameworks and the, the product mindsets that we need to have in different types of environments. And I've kind of highlighted here some, but it's not just um, the only ones, it's probably the ones to highlight. So in a classical, it's probably more project planning uh, approach, uh, more Moscow type of prioritization where you have like heavy backlog, things are going to come, there's not much that changes, a racy model, so for the ones who are not familiar, so responsible, accountable, um, kind of informed people, actors in the process. An adaptive one, I feel like data, 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 uh, it's really important. And I'm not just talking about analytics, I'm talking about um, both quantitative and qualitative data here, but knowing everything about um, your existing customer and your market is where the adaptive wins, but also very quick with experimentation and just trying things. Um, so a market that is constantly changing this is kind of the stuff that you want to keep in your pocket. Um, on the shaping one, because you don't know necessarily uh, what you're going to get, but at the same time, because it might be more of a uh, difficult uh, market to operate in because of all the competitors, you might need to think about a um, have some structure in terms of how you do the prioritization, but also think about your business canvas. So, um, being very clear in understanding what is the value that you're bringing, who are the players, um, who are, what are your cost structures, and et cetera. And then finally, your visionary, um, it's it's our, our lovely product vision there, design sprints in, th in, th in terms of thinking big and uh, outputting small, worldly maps, very good here as well. Um, and, you know, always remember that the markets are always changing. And on the back of that, you know, our lovely classical, like you were thinking, it's like, why is, is doing, advising us to look at the classical stuff? I hate the classical stuff. And I I hear you. <laughs> I mean, I hear you. A lot of people hear you. Uh, we know that there's a lot of uh, things happening right now. There's uh, war, AI uh, uh, really shifting uh, the market, um, the job market. We have climate change. So and predictive uh, uh, markets that you can control, they're a bit of a dying uh, species uh, because today there's not necessarily that much predictability. But it is a classical case, right? The the challenge that we have here is that many managers, uh, if they go to through their MBA programs, uh, they will they will have learned a, a very classical strategy style, and that has an impact on the way that they prioritize, the way that what they value. So accuracy and efficiency versus speed and experimentation. They know that they need to to be quick and to experiment to survive. Um, the changes in the market to survive uh, 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 all the things that are evolving, but they still pull very much into accuracy and efficiency. And then there is, this is tied over the uh, the money aspect, like we talked at the beginning, uh, because they need to have heavy uh, financial planning so they know how to control their cost structure. And this has a direct impact on how, the strategic uh, uh, cycles and decision making happen. So, for example, regardless of what's happening in the market, you'll still have companies that will do a yearly strategy review instead of, for example, maybe if things are changing quite quickly, you know, COVID that happened, um, strategies went 
uh, on the window, through the window. So you didn't wait to till the end of the year to make a review. You had to make a review then. So it's more kind of bringing that kind of mentality into it. And I feel like product people are the perfect people in the organization to bring that. So, you know, almost negating that feeling that you have, that what you are learning and how you're evolving as a product person doesn't really matter. It does massively. I'll show you. So one way to contrast the classical kind of uh, feeling is to think about agility. And I don't want to think, I know this is a loaded word, bear with me. I'm not talking about being agile. And you can, I've left there a few of the words that you can use for people who are a little bit tired of agile. It can be flexible. We can be nimble, right? So use these words. And, you know, if people are kind of traumatized by agile, don't use agile. Okay. It's fine. Nimble. Nimble sounds nice. Um, so let's see how we can do this and still not necessarily go against um, these points here, but go together. That's what we're trying to do today. So how there's there's three areas that you can apply this this kind of flexible mindset this nimble mindset see i did very good not mention agile mindset and um, we have the operations piece we have our portfolio piece and we have a strategy piece um just to clarify there the portfolio is not just a product portfolio but we're thinking about the company portfolio so in comp especially in industries where uh software isn't what you're selling so is uh, what you're used to support the main product that you're selling this should be considered in your portfolio as well. Just a little side note here. Um, but how product can help with this. So in operations, there's a huge need for shared and, and detailed uh, market and customer data, because otherwise you always be stuck going out and new, looking for uh, the next big thing and investing a lot of money in it. That should be something where you can actually invest and build on. Um, understanding current ways of working for your own sake, it's it's really important because you might hear in the next talk that, you know, we should all um, change to, I don't know, Kanban and, and drop Scrum a fall. Um, but the reality is that your tech might not be there, right? So if you don't have uh, something as simple as a staging environment, you, you, you'd kind of need to, to build that first, right? Understanding your business KPIs and how success, success is measured. So these kind of business KPIs and how success is measured is a good way to curtail the financial loop around this because you then can identify the metrics to measure success in your business. Very important here. Give more data. On the portfolio is the creation of options. So here, potentially, there is a bit of an innovation on the side. So everyone's been talking about ChatGPT. Is there any way that you could integrate that in your organization and show? You know, this is a very much the show uh, that the, the the do before you do the show and tell, essentially. Um, but also a lot around the clarity uh, around prioritization, because sometimes to know very well your portfolio, you also need to, we'll have to understand that's where the note comes from. You'll have to say no to a couple of things. If it's not working, stop investing in it. Don't push it. Help others do propel their other projects. And finally, strategy, right? Creation of values is really important right now. If you are waiting to survive this kind of difficult markets, having uh, customers who stay with you, having a strong um revenue sheet is really important so then you can focus and not feel like you're wasting time with other things and also be really true to your identity now let's take a step back and see the different areas of product that you get here so product operations given um or your portfolio how you manage your portfolio that's the remit of product discovery and and delivery and finally you have a product vision and strategy i mean it's a match made in heaven there, right? Um, but yes, yeah, so that is all that I wanted to, to say. I, If you wanted to, um, I hope it wasn't too quick. I can always go back to a couple of other slides um, uh, and go deep. I also left you here with a other resources so you can in, investigate a little bit further. So really important if you are not sure of the type of product person you are or the type of pers product person that you want to become, have a look at Melissa Perry uh, talk, Product of You. It's incredible. She actually breaks down the, the type of, goes into a lot more detail than I went at the beginning in terms of the product 
type for the type of businesses and the type of the size of the business that you're looking to go after. Um, in terms of uh, getting your uh, good, gaining good context of the organization that you're working in, uh, there's um, uh, Jerry, Georgie, sorry, Smallwood, who, uh, just like say, uh, Georgie, who has a very good talk about product tetrics uh, in terms of where can you build the next piece uh, to make sure that you don't lose the game. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, and then a little bit about VUCA. I don't know if you know much about this term, but is a strategy in volatile and certain um, complex markets. So really interesting if you want to go a little bit deeper in terms of uh, your knowledge and building context for uh, the organizations that you're working with, but also understanding, trying to have the conversation with the people who are driving that strategy, if you're not one of them, um, and, and how the business can equip themselves to um, survive sometimes these markets. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ines. It was really, really insightful. So now we will go into the q and um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so whenever you feel, okay, great. Give me a moment. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have that many questions. Everyone is either uh, mm -hmm. put, put me in the background or is shy. <laughs> Okay, so workshop. So um, it's time for q and We're going to leave a few minutes for people, you know, to gather their thoughts and of wrap their hair around it. And during this time, um, I will be sharing a little bit about more about proud people, you know. So uh, as we said before, we are product management consultancies uh, specialized in integral product management. But uh, we know that this arises a lot of questions like what are our for real case uses, you know, when people need this. So the most common one is as interim fractional product managers or product leaders. Um, we do permanent position covers. Uh, this means, for example, while you're hiring, like you had someone leaving the product team suddenly and you need to fill the gap, you know, and well, as you may know in Ash, for example, it takes a lot to hire a product manager. A manager. There are like a lot of requirements and so on. So in this time, uh, we step in, we fill the gap and also we bring value. Another use case is for parental covers. And this is really common too, you know, from three to 12 months, someone leaves the product team for a while and for obvious reasons. So that's when we step in. And also, for example, for important and urgent initiatives. For example, you want to launch an MVP or you want to drive product discovery or you have a deadline that you need to do delivery and create big impact, you know? So in three months, uh, we can do that. We can, as I said, fill the gap and drive the team when the current product team doesn't have the capacity because uh, sometimes they are overloaded with work. Our second use case is product coach or consultant. This also can work as a program manager or product operation. And that means coaching your product management team and praise the skills and set the personal development plans. And also create a streamlined process of program from zero to one or an hyper, hyper growth scale. And the third use case is for product discovery means discovering the next impactful initiative or product and you know market and user research business models and so on also another uh case as i talked before is running on low or no code pilot mvp and you know through all the phases discovering ideation aligning the team running and kicking off the next iteration and then the next question is what are we not doing, which is almost as important as what we actually do. So like all PMs with a fine and limited scope, uh, we're an agency specializing in interim product management who serves client only via in-house employees. 
which means as I said before, we're not freelancer, we're not a freelance marketplace, we're in-house with product people. Uh, the first thing is that we're not recruiters, which means that we won't source candidates. We're happy to share your role with our community for free and, you know, to keep that talent pool open. But we and also we can help appraise candidates as well as your hiring processes and successful onboard new PM or POs for you. As I said, we're not the freelance marketplace which means that our team is full in our payroll and we joined the team after a seven step recruitment process. Uh, we tender to each member's development and run 360 feedback sessions every one to three months, which means that we constantly are receiving feedback, knowing which things we can improve, what's working, what's not working, you know, and tag it in before it becomes an actual problem. And we're not a development or a design agency. As we said, we specialize in enterprise product management, including product ops and leadership coaching and discovery. So in case you need developers or designers, we are happy to introduce you a few, but we're product managers. So uh, here are some of our B2C clients, uh, Zalando, Tier, Scout, Douglas. We recently work with DeepAll and Backmarket. Ecosia, when it comes to sustainability, and Blinkist, for example, when it comes to apes. And we also have B2B clients like Utopia Music, the World Health Organization, GFK, and Satisfy. And here you can look at some of the positive feedback that we got from our clients. If you also, if you go to our public notion there, we have like all the references that we've received and depending on the client. So it might be um, better if you can want to check them out in there. And here are some numbers, some facts about us. Uh, we've been serving more than 70 clients from series eight startups to publicly listed companies, which means that around 200 cross-functional teams support it. Also, as I said, we're 40 product leaders and product managers in-house and full-time. So we ensure the quality of service for our clients and the strong career development path for our team members. That's also really important for us. And 60% women in the team and 66% women in leadership. And we have a strong bias to promote from within our firm and attract more women than the tech industry average, thanks to our, our skills before see this hiring process. Uh, here you can watch us, <laughs> see us, all of us. And uh, we are hiring, which is also something that we get asked a lot to. Right now we have an open talent pool for product managers, but we are also looking for non-PM roles, such as business development representative, and partnerships manager and junior content exclusive. You can go to our greenhouse to see it, but also if you follow us on LinkedIn, we have it our job posting in there. Feel free to uh, send your send your CV if you think you will be a good fit. So now and on to the proper Q and A. Um, I'll be looking at, at the questions if we have any and if we don't I I know that a couple ones so feel free to you know open the map if you want to share them live or just write them on the chat um I think that there's a few comments there and just wanted to even though I replied to them on on the zoom call for the ones uh, watching on YouTube thank you very much um I uh there's a another book suggestion so business model you uh that is from from Eluza she's uh very kind and and uh, talks about a, a book to understand a bit more about yourself as a product person I haven't read this one but I will thank you um 
Marcus, thank you so much for thinking that it was interesting. And you know, uh, you know, it might be a little bit too much information for 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 a twenty minute talk. Uh, but feel free to reach out over LinkedIn if you you know later on you're processing your reading. Um, you know, let me know if you want to have the slides. Also happy to to share them. Um, and same for Mariana. Thank you so much for for such nice comments. Um, if anyone, uh, Andre, if you want to go over your your questions. Yeah, uh, something that really popped out to me was, you know, the big diagram where you listed like multiple industries and in which part of the natives they usually fall their scope. Um, if you had to assess, like imagine that I go in a new job, in a new role to a new company, how would you assess in which part of the matrix that company falls? Because as you described, the market changes constantly and right now I think we're on a time that some industries they might be hybrid you know like really traditional industries like for example could be food industry that has been there forever since forever um they're changing and the market's more unpredictable so how would you assess that as a new joiner to a company yeah, absolutely. And I think that is an, an amazing question and personally an exercise that I run through um, at every single new organization that I join. And I feel like it's a bit of a an advantage. Um, there is, uh, I've given another talk about that um, in terms of creating your context and not necessarily uh, waiting for other people to create that context for you. Uh, so being proactive is really important. So starting to uh, create the layers of the organization. So starting to look at the industry will be really important. And also bear in mind that that chart, that matrix is a photograph of a movie, right? Things will, like you said, exactly, things will be changing, things will be moving, uh, just like our Kano model, uh, that some, you know, you have a delightful experience one day, but then the next day is everyone does it. And so it just becomes your standard reply. So you need to keep an eye to not just where you are today, but where the organization is planning to go in the future. And so this, when you join, there is a very important um, uh role for you to 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 run which is obviously have the conversations with people almost if you can do a bit of homework in terms of coming up to the meetings and the one-to-ones that you have with the different um parts of the business uh, and come with questions you know a lot of people I feel like a lot of people come unprepared to uh to those uh to those inductions and expect information to be given to them but it's you know you're still in an interview process almost because you are creating your own landscape I personally I always create a mirror board or a google document with all the expressions I don't understand and all the the strategy pieces uh that I that I visualize list all the products uh, list all the services and start creating your buckets. I think that that's a very important first step. And then take those buckets to people almost and say, you know, hey, marketing person, do, do you see this? Am I uh, looking at the right line here? Because it feels very similar to this other industry. And then you get this whole other conversation. And at the same time, you're building rapport with that, with that function. So you uh, can create, start creating your context. And then, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Um, We'll get something out, understand what is the reaction of the market. Because one thing is what you know internally, but it might be perceived. You don't know if that's a fact. So very rightly, you say that things are constantly moving. They are. So depending on the type of business that um, on where in the quadrant you are, things might move a little bit faster. So your perception is uh, might be one or the, the the business perception might be one, but the actual one, the one that is perceived by your customer base, by the markets, by the competitors might be a different one. And I always caveat this, a competitor is not necessarily a company that is in the same, selling the same products you are. It's just how are people solving the product, the problem today? So, and slowly, you don't need to do that in the first week. I mean, it's always something that you can, build as as you learn more and as you practice in that organization and almost you know see your work after a month of being there your first 30 days almost yeah great I completely agree with you I think that whenever we join a new organization it's like we're almost joining like a little universe 
mm-hmm. you know correct and we we bring our own personal little universe to that and you know we have to make them merge somehow and and I think it's a really interesting approach since you know market uh it's constantly changing and I can clearly see it on the on the last years especially since COVID that was like a as you said like throwing all the strategies through the window so that is my question. In fact, my other question was going to be uh, which resources would you recommend? But I think you read my mind and uh, really by the end of the presentation, you already recommended them and answer so for questions. So let me check if we have any we more do. questions on the chat. Yeah. Uh, so uh, how can we deal with situations where organization seems more obsessed with systems and processes than understanding their product and customer? Yeah, that is your typical, the classical case. Um, this is, you know, goes back to the situation when, you know, it was just highlighting in terms of needing reassurance, needing the planning, needing control over the situation. Uh, but the reality is, you know, we've seen here today and most people know there's very little that you can control from the moment that leaves the business. So in terms of strategies that you can put in place, I would say um, first make sure that you have um, the right context to move into action. So, for example, I've been in a business that um, they would only release twice a year. Right. If you're in this kind of business, if it, the business is quite risk averse, you will always face some uh, some troubles in in this uh, scenario here. Um, so what you need to do is start building confidence and uh, try reaching out to, for example, I'm assuming that this is a, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Hubla, but I'm assuming that this is a, a B2B context a heavy regulated or highly risk averse. And so you might have a few stakeholders in front between you and, and the customer base. Um, but I would have that as your priority, getting to that customer base, getting to those users. Um, if it's in a B2B context, don't forget the team uh, scenario. So not just the users, there are managers, there are teams and understand what are their needs uh, because they reaching out to them and making that connection will help you um, fasten that process. So let's say for argument's sake, you are with a team and you get a uh, you get with the, the, the engineering team and the design team, you build a prototype, either no code local solution or Figma prototype something, and you get to to share that with with your customer base. Um, even, you know, the plans can happen at the same time that you're doing this, right? You don't need to, the plans for the plans to wait for you to start testing these things. So sometimes there's um, a bit of a, a misalignment there, but you can have both, okay? Um, and then share with the organization. Share what happens when you put something in, in customers' hands or in front of customers and the conversations that come up. Because that is the most valuable thing that you can bring it back. And you start to think that urgency. You start listening to what people on the other side from your laptop uh, are saying. And then you can have proof that you need to move faster. So, you know, this can be a whole talk uh, altogether. So I hope that, you know, summary, uh, the best kind of approach to, to this is to... Um, you know, on this almost, I don't want to say on the side because you should talk about this and you should say, you know, I'm not going to, this is not something I'm going to sell. I'm just going to use it as a mechanism to to chat with people and get to understand our customers. Um, and that slowly will start building up into, into your program. Uh, but also, you know, don't forget that if the context is slow, everything else will be slow as well. And um, don't build frustration as in it's it's your fault or it reflects poorly on you. It's it's nothing to do with you. It's just the systems need to, to change. You know, or look at that slide uh, in terms of what are the systems in your organization? What can you play with? I hope that was okay. I, well, at least for me, it was really interesting. Uh, we have another question from Sarah. Uh, well, Hubble said thank you. So I guess it was a nice answer. 
And from Sarah, she asked, how would you deal with when a huge company is in a visionary quadrant, but the company doesn't have a real vision, but you can also not reach senior management to work with them on it. Yeah, it's uh, it's difficult, isn't it? Um, if, um, you know, product management is really complicated and these things are really complicated. You have all the insight and very little influence. Um, starting to have the conversations with the senior management might be challenging, but if they are in the same company as you are, um, I'll just reach out to them, uh, really. It might be that there is a vision, but it's just not communicated in at the right level. It might not be communicated clearly. So a polite way to put that question, if you'd like to get some clarity, is to say, sorry, I couldn't find any details on this year's strategy. You know, start small, you know, goals, plans, and maybe get a conversation in. I think that we shouldn't be shy of having the conversations or worried about how we're going to come across when having these conversations. Because if the company is visionary, you need to be... Um, looking at the big play um, and at the same time understanding what are the small steps. So if you don't have the balance of the two, it will be incredibly challenging for you to do your job. And so looking at, you know, you need to ask yourself if you'd be comfortable in um, stepping into the operations world for a little bit and maybe use that as an excuse to um, understand the systems of the organization a little bit better. Maybe uh, they are in a shared drive that no one has access to, and maybe that's the easiest way to, to solve the problem, especially if it's a large organization. Um Things are never in the place where you expect them or someone is, I don't know, so it's in someone's uh, uh, folder. And sometimes that's the, the easiest way, you know, speak with HR as well. Not necessarily in a problem that you have with your uh, with yourself, but normally they're an independent party as much as possible um, when wanting to, to get some more um, uh, company insights or people from operations, you know, larger organization will definitely have um, an operation side, and they will have access to this kind of this kind of information. And then, if you ask enough people, maybe you'll get a little bit of a stir. And um, if you feel like you're in a safe place, um, you know, put your hand up to 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 help build that with all the talks and podcasts and books that you that you read and and you come up with. But um, I would say that if it's a large organization and the vision. Uh, space, it might be that is just poorly, poorly communicated. Um, and you need to have access to that, to that stuff. Hope that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, Sarah said that creating a stir is a nice idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like poking the right people at the right place. You never know what's going to happen. And then you go, like, oh, I did. What? I was just asking a question. I don't know what happened here. Can I help? <laughs> I love that you have that attitude, Sarah. Very good. So I think uh, for now, that's all the questions we, we had. Um, so I think we can conclude the meeting. Uh, Leonor, let me know if we have any other questions about the rest of the panel. Uh, I don't think so. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you can watch all our future events in our meetup. And also we have our own podcast that we've just finished the first season. And also we have our Telegram group where we share, you know, more. I would say we create a stair too. Um, and we have many topics discussed in there. So uh, this is all for today. Thank you very much for everybody joining and we hope to see you in future events. And I think you know, it's that maybe you left some topics on the back. As you said, there are some topics that would make another, another <laughs> talk. So who knows in the future, we will have you again here. Well, thank you so much. It was wonderful uh, chatting with you today. And yeah, you know, my LinkedIn is 
uh, available. I know that they now changed a bit of the the settings, but if you can drop a message to say that you know this is where uh, you kind of heard of me, that'd be great. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for having me today. It was lovely, and good luck with your adventures, <laughs> product adventures. Definitely. <laughs> Okay.